So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pietro Mumeshi, uh, Musumeci, uh, who's an associate professor of physics and astronomy at UCLA. Uh, he's the head of the Pegasus Laboratory, where they're working on a new uh, advanced photo injector facility uh, there at UCLA. He has a background in laser acceleration and free electron laser physics. And in 2005 to 2006, he led the commissioning of Italy's first photo injector facility. Uh, his current research interests are in the application of new laser technologies to the development of ultra-short particle beam, beams from compact accelerators uh, with the thinking that they're going to be used in the context of both basic research and high energy physics and eventually with medical applications. Uh, today he's talking to us about the production and properties of X-ray free electron lasers. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Mameshi, and uh, we welcome anything you might want to add to that introduction or correct. Um, we're now, we turned over the presenter mode to you, so you should be able to take over for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, can you guys uh, see my screen and the presentation? Yes. Okay, very good. So basically this is like a general uh, introductory uh, lecture on uh, X-ray free electron laser and uh, their main uh, uh, characteristics. Um, so feel free to uh, um, ask questions, and I sent a PDF file of the presentation, so um, you you will you will have those notes. Um, let me start by saying that there is a lot of great material. Are you guys still online? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, there is a lot of great material uh, on the web, and uh, for this, in order to prepare these notes, I. I took advantage of uh, um, a lot that I found. In particular, there is a, a US uh, from a collaborator, so from courses on the web. There is a nice US particle accelerator school course from Zhirong Wang and Pan Jai Kim. Uh, Slack organizes a summer school on electron and photon beams, and they have an excellent website with a lot of lectures on XFL and high brightness beam. And, um, um, I also took advantage of my relationship with my uh, old advisor, Claudio Pellegrini, which is one of the fathers of the XFL. Okay, so this is the outline of uh, uh, the lecture. At the beginning, I'll just give a gen very general introduction on why, what is an X-ray uh, free electron laser and what are the key elements to build one, why would we want to build one. And then uh, the, the lecture is kind of uh, uh, as a... Um, the next topic, I basically discuss the basic properties of the radiation from accelerated relativistic electrons. Um, then I turn, I move on the, the, the actual discussion of the FEL collective instabilities, which will allow us to understand better the properties of the radiation in uh, X-ray FEL. And I will conclude with uh, um, five or six slides on the status of the research. Uh, what is, uh, we're still doing a lot of research in XFEL and uh, what do we want to accomplish with that, even though some of them is working, but we want to improve the characteristics. Okay, so let's start with the introduction and of course the motivation of uh, in, uh, why would somebody, someone want to build an X-ray FEL is due to the fact that uh, uh, these light sources have a very wide tunability range from uh, uh, 10 nanometer down to one axiom. They are both transversely and at least partially longitudinally coherent, and they're very intense. They can reach a, a very high peak power, hundreds of gigawatt. We are studying how to make teravatt XFL, and the pulse length is also very short. So in fact, the XFL is the only instrument that can explore matter at the atomic, characteristic atomic length and time scale. So there is a angstrom and a femtosecond. It has a wide range of application. Of course, the fact that the light is coherent, uh, mm -hmm. is coherent and uh, make possible uh, imaging. And so we can image both periodic and non-periodic structure at the nanometer and the sub-nanometer scale because the wavelength of the light is so short. Uh, taking advantage of the fact that the X-ray FEL make very short pulses, we um, can do fast, uh, uh, do ultra-fast science. We can explore the dynamics of whatever we're looking at. And there is another advantage is that by taking an image very quickly, we can avoid the limit set by the sample damage in the image. Mm -hmm. Also, because XFL are so intense, uh, we can study nonlinear optics of the X-rays or high energy density systems. 
Um, so there is a lot of advantages, of course, in, and there are a variety of applications. The list of users at the XFL is very long. Um, this slide here shows the uh, kind of uh, um, uh, two different uh, uh, scales. The, the scale uh, on the left there is a length scale, and uh, the XFL because it has angstrom wavelength uh, allows us to explore the uh, uh, you know sub nanometer region. But at the same time, because it has pulse length of like 100 to 10 femtosecond, it allows us to explore like very fast phenomena. So far, we could explore like this very small time scales only with, like, for example, electron microscopy, or like, uh, but not, uh, or even synchrotron sources, but not, we couldn't do at the same time have pulses of like less than 100 femtoseconds. So for the first time, the XFL put together so ultra small thing. and ultra fast. Um, so we start from uh, the beginning of laser. I mean, an X-ray FEL is in fact a laser, and this the story starts in the 60s uh, with uh, Ted Maiman and the invention of the laser. And of course, lasers are great because they cover uh, all the way the region from infrared to EUV, and they can make very short pulses. The only thing they cannot do, they cannot. Uh, they're not a very. There is no laser at very short wave. But since the beginning. Uh, of the laser already from the 60s, 60s people thought about developing lasers at uh, um, very short wavelength, that is X-ray laser. Now, this is a very difficult thing to do because uh, if you just take the uh, conventional atomic physics uh, laser approach, um, the core level that you need to excite to get the inversion population are very short lifetime and you need to put a lot of energy. These are like 10 kilovolt uh, uh, energy levels compared to, his, to the one electron volt for visible laser. As a consequence, you need to pump the inversion of population um, with a very intense flash lamp, if you want. Uh, there is another complication if you're building a laser that there is no mirrors, at, in the, or I mean, there is not that uh, good mirrors, at least, uh, in the X-ray region. So X-ray optics is... Uh, um, uh, they're not readily available. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, this is interesting. I mean, uh, to overcome this problem in the 80s, people, because you need such a very high intensity flash lamp to pump an inversion population in, uh, for x-rays, that people suggested to use an atomic bomb to actually create the inversion of population. This was actually tried at Livermore in the 80s as a part of the Star Wars Defense Initiative. So they, the idea was to set up nuclear bombs, get inversion of population, and get X-ray laser out. Um, this was, of course, not very convenient. And uh, when the Star Wars problem uh, program was terminated, the, the actual this uh, kind of research ended. But the, you, if you look online, you find like a, a, a publication related to this uh, approach. Luckily, there is a more convenient solution to get an X-ray laser, and this is like the X-ray FEL the SASI X-ray FEL. This was proposed back in 1992, and in fact, the first light from Stanford came in 2009. Mm -hmm. So right now, in the world, I would say that there are four working X-ray laser, the one in green, the LCLS at Stanford, the Flash facility, and the Fermi facility in Europe. These are soft X-ray. They have wavelength between 10 nanometer and 1 nanometer. And then the SAKLA in Japan is got the sub, sub nanometer wavelength, angstrom wavelength. But there's also a lot of other projects coming online or that have been um, uh, built or developed. Uh, this is the LCLS2 in the US, uh, the XFL in Germany, the Swiss FEL in Switzerland, and the Korean PAL XFL. Um, if you, uh, this plot here on the left is a plot of uh, uh, brightness, the peak brilliance of uh, measured in the conventional units of photons uh, uh, per uh, um, second, per stereo radian, per millimeter, per 0.1% bandwidth. So basically, the number of photons in the phase space, uh, the density of photon in the phase space as a function of the photon energy. And there's a lot of different light sources here. What you should appreciate that the XFL allowed a nine orders of magnitude jump in the peak brightness of uh, X-ray sources. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the rest of the lecture, I guess, we'll try to understand how do we get this, uh, um, how do these nine orders of magnitude became uh, possible. But of course, you know, appreciate like the, the big jump that was uh, um, 
allowed by the introduction of SFI. Okay, so let me start uh, from the basic, I would say, which is uh, um, how do we get uh, radiation from a free charged particle? And I put online here this uh, uh, nice link, and uh, uh, let me try to show you. Basically, there are different different possibilities for getting a um, particle to radiate. You you can, uh, um, of course, when there is an acceleration, uh, as soon as there is an acceleration, there is a radiation. When a particle is moving with constant velocity, but in a medium uh, uh, which has uh, um, uh, speed of light velocity lower than the particle velocity. This is child of radiation. Then if the particle stops, that's transition radiation, or if it goes nearby a periodic medium, like Smith Purcell radiation. I'm gonna for a second get out of the PowerPoint, uh, tell me if this is not working, and show you this nice application from uh, the link, www.shintake lab. Um, hopefully everybody can still see the screen. Um, uh, the, uh, so basically, this is a particle, which is, uh, uh, this is this is an applet which calculates the radiation from a charged particle. Mm -hmm. I can take my mouse and move this particle. No. Uh, let's see. If I move this particle up and down, the, the, this applet calculates the radiation field. So this line of the electric field, now you see they are coming out of the particle. If the particle is steady, there is no radiation. As soon as I move the particle in and out, then basically dipole radiation comes out. You, everybody can play with it. There is the link and the applet is on the lecture. You can put like uh, trajectories, like for example, you can start a dipole oscillation, and this is the typical radiation pattern of an antenna that comes out. Uh, you can also change, for example, the trajectory, and let's see what happens if I put an undulator. That's what we'll study in the next uh, uh, few slides. So if you see uh, the particle moving in an undulate, undulating uh, trajectory, it emits um, a uh, radiation uh, forward. Uh, these are the radiation front that are coming from. Okay? So uh, this is a very nice, uh, um, you know, uh, applet to calculate the radiation of charged particle. Uh, we will go in detail and, uh, and try to understand the characteristics of this emitted radiation. So in order to approach it, uh, of course, uh, we start from the linear Vickert field. These are like the uh, field, uh, the retarded field. You have to, uh, if uh, the, there is a trajectory, the particle is moving on a trajectory with a given velocity, the electric and magnetic field at an observation point D can be written um, as a sum, in fact, of two contributions. The first term in the electric field goes like 1 over r squared. This is like the Coulomb, let's say, the Coulomb electric field. More interesting for us is the field that um, drops only as 1 over r. So that large distances, this uh, second term in the radiation is going to be the uh, main contribution to the radiation field. And uh, um, uh, the, the thing you have to do here is that uh, the particle velocity and the particle accelerator uh, accelerations, these are beta and beta dot, have to be calculated at the uh, retarded time condition, of course. Now, let's look at the denominator here um, to see an important properties of this radiation field when the particles are relativistic. You can expand this denominator and uh, um, uh, for small angle, there is an angle between uh, um, n the, 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 and the particle velocity. For small angle, you can expand this denominator, and this is the um, um, uh, expression you got. So, um, and this is represented here on the, on the left. So if you have like a simple dipole oscillation, this is a, a typical antenna at uh, zero velocity. But if the electrons are moving with large velocity, uh, there is a very strong uh, uh, boost of the uh, radiation cone. So the radiation is strongly peaked in the forward direction. And the angle in which is strongly peaked is basically 1 over gamma. Okay? So this is important properties of radiation emitted from a relativistic electron. Uh, if you basically, as I regard the students, you just turn to Jackson to uh, uh, get the formulas for the, uh, emi the radiation emission from a, a charged particle, and we can write uh, uh, using the linear Vickert the potential. You can write uh, the radiation frequency angular distribution, and it's written 
by this expression over here, and we, uh, this integration is over the particle's trajectory. Basically, we have to integrate uh, everywhere the electron is accelerating. Okay, so let's apply this formula to, uh, and uh, let's understand the radiation properties in a couple of cases. The first one we're looking at is basically synchrotron radiation, the radiation you get if you bend uh, a charged particle. Uh, in this case, the spectrum, um, which is also shown here on the bottom left, is very broadband. Why is it very broadband? Because the time of observation, the duration of the radiation, is set by the angular aperture of this radiation, by this 1 over gamma cone. So the geometry of 1 over gamma, uh, this, this, uh, they combine to give a, a very small duration for the uh, radiation observed by our observer. So that translates in a very large critical frequency. So the spectrum is basically continuous all the way to a critical frequency, which increasing strongly uh, with gamma. And this radiation, of course, doesn't have any uh, uh, periodicity, it's just a continuous spectrum. Now, in the 50s, Mott um, had the idea uh, of using a long array of this bending magnet, uh, which is called an undulator magnet, uh, to generate, instead of like a very broad band radiation, a narrow band um, uh, frequency content. Uh, so now the electrons have a sinusoidal trajectory when they move in this uh, array of uh, dipole magnets. And um, of course, Moss in the 50s already evaluated the energy of the radiation pulses. And uh, um, this is what we're going to do in the next few slides. OK, so um, uh, these are the expression for the magnetic field of an undulator. Um, so the, you can look at this thing. Uh, this is a planar undulator. So the particles are oscillating in one plane, the x axis here. Uh, you can think of, uh, let's start for, this, uh, for a second uh, to look at this uh, expression uh, on axis. That means when y equals 0. When y equals 0, there is no bz, and uh, by, the vertical component of the magnetic field, is oscillating with a wave number uh, ku, the undulator wave number, 2 pi over the undulator p. Now, off axis, you have to expand this uh, hyperbolic cosine. There is, the expression is here because, of course, the magnetic field has to obey. Uh, the Maxwell equation has to be divergence-free, uh, even on axis. So that's the general expression for the magnetic field. So then you can integrate the motion of a relativistic electron. Of course, the energy of the electron is constant because you're only moving in a magnetic field. Um, and you can calculate the electron velocity. So of course, the x velocity is the integral of by and is basically oscillating back and forth with amplitude of k over gamma. If the x velocity is oscillating, also b and z um, needs to change too, because remember that again, gamma is, uh, has to be constant, because there is no work done on the particle by the magnetic field. And in fact, b and z in a planar undulator has, is oscillating with twice uh, the uh, 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 frequency. So in fact, if we plot the motion of the electron in, uh, in, uh, in its rest frame, it's a figure eight motion. So it's not a simple dipole antenna, it's a figure eight. And this is important because it leads to the emission of harmonics. If it was a, a simple dipole antenna, it will only emit one particular frequency. Um, now um, it actually emits all the harmonics uh, because of this figure eight motion. Remember, this is the electron motion in the rest frame. In order to find the frequency of the radiation in the lab, you have to boost this, uh, go back, I guess, in the, in the lab rest frame to find out what is the frequency. And this k parameter here I define it is basically the undulator normalized vector potential. This is the expression for it. OK, so how do we find what is the uh, peak of the, what is the uh, wavelengths that are emitted by an electron when it's going to an undulator? Um, you can do the Lorentz frame boost. I mean, uh, here I choose to show you what's the, 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 the resonant uh, wavelength uh, by interference. So um, as the electron go around this trajectory, right, and this is the time it takes for the electron to go around this trajectory, lambda divided by beta g c, the radiation wavefront uh, per, um, travels a distance of L uh, lambda u times cosine theta. So mm -hmm. this is this segment over here. Now, there is uh, constructive interference if um, uh, this uh, time difference is an integer mu multiple of a wavelength. Mm -hmm. So um, this is what is written over here. 
and uh, we can uh, use some algebra and uh, rewrite it and, and we can expand this for very relativistic electrons and for a very small angle to uh, find the expression for uh, the resonant wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So the resonant wavelength is proportional to one over gamma square. So with a centimeter period, which is easy to build with magnets, using very high energy electrons, you can access nanometer of angstrom wavelength. Mm -hmm. And there are other things to notice. The uh, radiation uh, wavelength depends on the angle. And uh, also that there is not only one uh, resonant wavelength, but all the harmonics of that frequency will also uh, be resonant, at least in this interference uh, 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 formulation. Okay, so this is uh, the general formula for the resonant wavelength of the radiation emitted by the electrons. We can calculate the differential spectrum. So this is going back to the Jackson formula and do that uh, integral, and you get this kind of comp for the planar undulator trajectory, and you get this kind of uh, uh, complicated expression over here. Which uh, um, let's look a little bit in detail. So if I plot the radiation um, on axis, uh, so it's this plot here on the left, so which tells us the uh, angular, the, sorry, the frequency width of this uh, radiation, which is proportional. You see, this frequency width is given by this uh, sine x over x term. This is a sync formula, and the and uh, x is uh, the number of periods times the um, uh, deviation from the resonant frequency. So you see that the width of this uh, uh, spectral distribution is proportional to one over the number of periods. Uh, there is another important thing to know. This is that there is a very strong correlation between frequency and angle. And this, uh, if you remember the expression of the resonant wavelength, uh, it's easy to see. For for very large angle, the gamma square theta square uh, term becomes large, and so you have long wavelength and uh, uh, small frequencies. So only on axis you. you have the um, uh, resonant uh, uh, wavelength, the maximum, uh, uh, the shortest resonant wavelength or the maximum frequency. So very strong correlation between uh, frequency and angle in undulator radiation. There is another way to understand uh, why uh, the uh, line width of the radiation emitted by an electron in an undulator is 1 over nu. So basically, think about an electron which is oscillating back and forth in uh, n periods. It will emit. Is there a question? No. Um, so if you, um, the, this electron will emit. Uh, n different cycle of radiation wavelength. So now if you Fourier transform a wave packet with n different cycle, the line width you get, of course, is 1 over n. Okay? So uh, for the typical case of a X-ray laser like LCLS, the gamma is 30,000. The energy of the beam is 15 GeV. The typical undulator period that I use are 3 centimeters. The magnetic field is 1 tesla, so the normalized undulator vector potential is 3. There is about uh, 3,000 periods. This is the um, uh, resonant wavelength is 1 angstrom. And uh, the um, uh, line width is 1 over 3,000. That means uh, um, uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And the duration of this uh, the radiation pulse emitted by a single electron so far, so far we're only studying the radiation emitted by single electrons, is on the order of uh, uh, 0.3 micro, okay? N u times lambda. Okay, so um, still staying on the single electron, let's understand a little bit the properties of the um, emitted radiation. So basically I want to, in the next few slides, I want to discuss how coherent is this uh, X-ray radiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we basically want to count uh, how many photons are in a phase space area. And uh, uh, the um, coherent phase space area for a photon beam, so this is the phase space uh, uh, position and angle. This is related by, of course, uh, photon um, uh, obeys the uh, 
uh, uncertainty principle, the quantum uncertainty principle. But basically, the, um, for uh, the coherent area for a photon uh, of uh, wavelength lambda is lambda over 4 pi. If you have uh, x and y, of course, like the minimum 4D phase space area is lambda over 4 pi squared. This is a concept that is important because, as we will see, it will also enter um, the phase space area is a concept that we will find also when we deal uh, with electron beam. But right now we're just looking at the properties of the um, X-ray uh, radiation. For the longitudinal dim uh, the dimension, we also have the same uh, uncertainty principle, which basically tells us that uh, the line width is going to be short if we make a very long uh, radiation pulse, so one over uh, n, uh, and the, and the, which is related, basically, the line width is related to the number of pig, to one over the number of pig. Now, because there is a dependence between the emitted radiation and the angle, so in order to emit radiation within this line width, the emission angle must be limited. So if the emission angle is very large, of course, this radiation emitted is not going to fall within the um, uh, line width uh, transform limited uh, uh, line width of the radiation, and so it's not coherent anymore. So in order to collect only the coherent photons, we only have to look exactly on axis. So, uh, or at least on axis uh, within this uh, uh, critical angle theta c. And uh, if we consider, of course, diffraction limited radiation, this corresponds as a source uh, which is given by this expression over here. So, for LCLS, this uh, coherent angle is one micro radian, okay? and the uh, source incoherent, uh, I guess, the source size is, uh, or the coherent source size, sorry, is, is uh, 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 10 micro. So we can go back to um, uh, di uh, d omega d omega, the double differential spectrum, and integrate in order to calculate the number of photons which are emitted within the line width and within the coherent angle. This is the number of coherent photons emitted by the, a single electron traveling in the undulator. I want to show you, because first of all, this is a very nice formula, which is easy to remember. It's basically pi alpha k squared uh, plus, and there is some uh, you know, other terms, but uh, uh, for k on the order of, of 1, uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, this is basically the, 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 the formula. And this is like a standard, uh, um, uh, you know, this expression, this is the number of coherent photons emitted by electron. This number does not depend on anything also. Alpha here is the fine structure constant. So it's, this is a small number. Basically, each electron emits only 1 over 100 coherent photons. So you need 100 electrons to emit one coherent photon, basically. This number does not depend on the wavelength, on the electron energy, on the undulator length. Of course, if you make the undulator longer, the uh, line width becomes smaller and the uh, coherent angle becomes smaller. So in the end, the number of photons in the coherent phase space volume stays constant. And for single electrons, it's a very small number. This is the take home message. I mean, the last three slides basically um, come to this point. For a single electrons going to an undulator, the number of coherent photons is small. Is on the order of uh, uh, the percent. This is the physics, basically, so far, we have described the physics of synchrotron radiation light sources. The, the, uh, this is like, uh, of course, a long history of synchrotron radiation light sources. This is, uh, of course, a spin off of particle accelerator. Um, the, the generation there is kind of uh, divided in generation. The first generation of synchrotron light sources is basically a parasitic facility. You had like a beam going by, and uh, because the beam was bending around, uh, you had the radiation emitted. This is uh, in the 50s and in the 60s, that's uh, all you were getting. Then people start using these X-rays, and then develop like the second generation X-ray sources. Uh, you have a dedicated ring that is not used for energy physics, but is really used just for synchrotron radiation. And then the third generation uh, is when you people started to optimize this uh, synchrotron radiation by putting in undulators, by building a lot of beam lines, trying to improve uh, the uh, flux, uh, coherent flux of these X-rays. And these are like the latest generation light sources. Now there is 70 of these uh, light sources worldwide. So everybody that is serve a large community of users. So what we have studied so far, what, uh, what I went through so far, 
is the physics of basically single electrons going through insertion devices and generating um, x-rays and they're not making a lot of x-rays this is the problem what happens now if you have a lot of electrons when and you send them in uh, and you make them radiate okay there are two um, possibilities uh, one the top line here is when these electrons are in kind of a disordered state so um, all the single electron wave trains will be superimposed with random phases. So in this case, the total intensity, uh, basically you have noise in the electron distribution, and the total intensity scales like the number of electrons. So you just sum up the intensities. Mm -hmm. But of course, everybody knows if you, have, if you have the possibility of having all these electrons emit in phase, then uh, the intensity over here, you see the y-axis here, is much larger. In fact, uh, it scales like the number of electrons squared. Uh, this ordering parameter, which we'll discuss in the next few slides, is what is called the bunching factor. It basically describes how well phased are these electrons on the scale of the radiation wavelength. Beta equal one, it means they all have the same phases, the perfect order. Now, of course, this is very attractive because, sorry, because uh, NE for typical electron beam, the number of electrons in the beam is large, 10 to the 9. So you can increase the intensity by a factor of 10 to the 9, 9 orders of magnitude, and this is a very large gain. Um, now, uh, of course, you, uh, you have to count the number of electrons in a wavelength. So really, the number of uh, electrons in a wavelength at one angstrom is on the order of 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4. So this is basically the factor you can hope for. Anyhow, the problem is this, is still this. How do we get the electrons ordered on the scale of uh, the uh, angstrom or the nanometer, the radiation wavelength? How do we go from an initially disordered state to this ordered state where ordered state where all the electrons emit coherently. And the answer is you take advantage of the free electron laser interaction. Um, let me, uh, before we go in the details in the, of the free electron laser interaction, let me still, um, let me look uh, at what is the, uh, how to calculate the frequency angular distribution in the case of multiple electrons. So what, this is exactly the same formula that we had before, except that now, I have the sum over the number of electrons of the basically intensity emitted, and we have to take the sum with the right phase. We have to evaluate the sum, taking into account the phase of the emitted radiation. So, uh, of course, here you have all the electrons might have different velocities or different positions. At the beginning, let's consider that they all have the same velocity, but they only are spread in the longitudinal position. So the only term that is different for each electron is the z component in this uh, exponential over here. So this is what is uh, um, uh, uh, you know, expanded over here. So all the electrons, this, this term is the same for all the electrons. This term is different for all the electrons. So in this expression over here, you see that I can collect, they all give exactly the same contribution except for this phase term over here. This exponential of the relative phase, uh, basically, of the electron in the radiation wave. So we can write uh, the frequency angular distribution for a bunch of electrons by collecting all this uh, sum, which is really the bunching, mm. sorry, the bunching factor that I defined before. And then, uh, so the total uh, intensity is going to be the single electron intensity times the number of electrons squared times this bunching factor squared. So for example, for a Gaussian uh, bunch, uh, which has a given uh, RMS length, then this is the coherent, uh, uh, basically the bunching factor uh, for, uh, uh, for the Gaussian uh, bunch. So basically, uh, you see that if uh, sigma um, is much smaller than, uh, than the frequency, than uh, the wavelength, uh, then uh, the intensity is going to be proportional to n squared. And of course, uh, uh, this number instead is 0 if the uh, uh, frequency is very large, if uh, basically the bunch length is larger than the radiation wavelength. Now, one would think, okay, you can just start emitting these electrons, typically we emit them from a photocathode, which are already bunched at this nanometer or sub-nanometer wavelength, but unfortunately, the emission of electron from a uh, uh, surface 
is dominated by the shot noise. So there is no way you can emit electrons. Actually, there's people that are trying to do that, but uh, so far, of course, this, the, the, this doesn't work. But they emit electrons at the nanometer or some nanometer wavelength and then preserve all the way to the radiation. This is, uh, it's actually not possible. So typically, we have that the intensity of the radiation is just proportional to the number of the electrons. Um, now, uh, we, we will need free electron laser in order to, um, uh, to get uh, uh, the bunching factor to be uh, not zero, but to be different than zero. Now, um, before we go in and describe the dynamics of the FEL, uh, we consider uh, the uh, expression for the, uh, we, we consider what happens if the velocities uh, so before we just assume the longitudinal position uh, of each electron is different. Now, so this was the, for all electrons, we assume the same velocities. In fact, that's not a realistic assumption. All the electrons might have slightly different velocities. In order to um, understand what happens in this case, of course, the, uh, in fact, the, even for the electrons, the concept of phase space is important. Now, the quantum element of the electron phase space is very small because the Compton wavelength is very small. But in order for the electrons to emit coherently, this is like, uh, um, it's enough if the emittance of the electron beam, that means the area in phase space of the electron beam, is smaller than the radiation phase space. So this limit of the Compton uh, uh, um, uh, wavelength actually for most beams, most beams occupy a phase space area much larger than this. Uh, but uh, in order to, for them to emit coherently, this is an important condition for FEL also later because you want in an FEL, you want the particle to emit coherently. You need the emittance of the electron beam to be smaller than lambda over 4 pi. So what is, uh, uh, so what happens? Uh, what are all the contribution to the line width uh, depending on the all the electron distribution, not the bunching factor? So if the electrons have different energy, you can basically expand the radiation, emitted radiation, in terms of the energy of the electrons, of the variation of the magnetic field of the electrons field, and on the different velocities, which give you a different angle of emission. So, uh, delta, uh, um, so the delta lambda over lambda is given by the sum of three terms. The first term is the um, variation in energy due to the, to the fact that all the particles do not have all the same energy. They have an uh, energy spread. This term is due to the fact that the magnetic field changes if you go off axis, the Cauch term that we saw before. And this term is due to the um, actual change in angle, which gives you an exp uh, a contribution on the uh, change in wave. So you can collect these two terms and you find out that the emittance, which is uh, related to the part difference in particle position and different particle velocity, basically gives a contribution which is an eff effective energy spread. So um, what I want to say in the last three slides, let me summarize if, uh, uh, so that all trying to get everybody again on the same page. Uh, the effect of the finite electron beam distribution when you have many electrons, not all the electrons have the same uh, velocity and the same energy, is to basically degrade the emission, the coherent emission. So this plot over here shows uh, single electrons for uh, when you have like uh, 100 periods when you have a different energy spread. So of course, if you have the beam which has a lot of energy spread, then uh, or a lot of emittance, then the emission is not going to be good. So in order to get coherent emission, you want to have good uh, properties the good, the, of the electron beam. OK. Um, so uh, let's describe the mechanism. This is basically half, a little bit half, um, judging of the time of the talk. So, but uh, uh, um, let's uh, look quickly at the uh, dynamics. Uh, this uh, stimulated undulated radiation. So, what what is that we have to introduce in the discussion in order to make the electron bunch? And we have to introduce basically the electromagnetic wave at a frequency near the uh, undulated radiation frequency, uh, which is co-propagating with the electron beam. The first experiments in this was done by uh, Mady. Uh, at uh, Stanford in 1971. And the nice thing is that this entire system doesn't need the Planck constant to be described. This is a perfectly, uh, we're just going to use classical mechanics to describe free electron laser interaction. The way it works is uh, explained a little bit in uh, uh, cartoon Y over here. 
So uh, because of in the interaction between uh, this uh, radiation field and the electrons, so now the difference before is the, the electron trajectory is not just determined by the magnetic field of the undulator, but there is also the radiation field that changes the electron trajectory. So uh, uh, now, uh, because of this uh, radiation field, there is an induced energy modulation uh, on the electron beam. The electrons don't, do not have all the same energy as they travel to the magnetic field. There is also an electric field, and so they can change energy. There is an energy modulation. This energy modulation, as they travel in the undulator, uh, gets converted into a density modulation. So now the bunching factor is larger than zero. You have a larger emission and so a larger electric field. And so now you're gonna again go back again, you're gonna induce a larger energy modulation, this process repeats and you have exponential growth. Uh, the mathematics, uh, if you're still up for it, are uh, described over here. Uh, these are the uh, expression for the change, uh, uh, the equation for the change in energy for a single particle. You basically are putting an electric field, the electric field of the radiation over here, what is important to, sh to see is that uh, this energy exchange is determined by the relative phase between the radiation field and the velocity of the particles. So in the relative phase, there is the radiation phase plus the undulator phase. Of these two terms, one cancels out when you average over a single period. These are the equation of the particle motion, not just in an undulator field, but in an undulator with an external radiation field. This is KL, is the normalized vector potential of the radiation field. The dynamics here looks like a pendulum dynamics. You see the, the momentum is changing with a poten it's moving in a potential which has a cosine-like potential. Mm -hmm. These are the particle trajectory and phase space. What is happening over here, what I want, the only thing that I want to say of this uh, here is that the particle originally are all over all faces, but as they travel in this uh, phase uh, potential, they all get bunched, they, go, they all get attracted towards the center. This is what makes them bunch. Um, you also, now the field is changing, so the way to describe the field change, we typically appro I use the slow and slowly, vary, slowly varying envelope approximation. So we describe the field with a slowly varying envelope function times uh, the, uh, its, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the exponential, e to the i k z minus omega t. You can solve the field equation, and this is what the field equation uh, gets. So the FEL is a system now in which you have to solve three equations. The two particle, uh, sorry, the two particle uh, dynamics equation, these are the equation for the electron motion, and they are coupled with the equation for the evolution of the radiation. So the collective instability is exactly this process in which when you solve this uh, coupled differential equation, uh, you get an electron energy modulation on the scale of the wavelength. This energy modulation turns into electron bunching. So at the beginning, all the particles are emitted random, are, are randomly, and they're emitting randomly. Now, due to the interaction, the particle bunch. These are uh, 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 basically really a snapshot of uh, uh, electron distribution in the Z looking at the electron beam, and you see it becomes like pancake. Now, thanks to the coherent enhancement, uh, they emit much stronger radiation, and so they are going to have a larger energy modulation. What is the result of this? It's an exponential gain in the radiation. This is the self-organization due to the FEL interaction. Not a single electron, multiple electrons, radiation feedback on, on the electron trajectory, you get exponential gain. Now, uh, the, the question is how to stack this exponential gain, and you can start the, and, uh, this by spontaneous radiation, so the, the, the beam emits spontaneous radiation, which then starts this uh, instability process. So this is basically an electron instability. Um, the, um, um, the next couple of slides, they describe the mathematics of this electron instability. Uh, the only thing that the reason why I put these formulas here, of course, you have them in the notes, so you can go back and use the notes as a reference. What I want to show you, basically, these are the three um, coupled differential equations that you have to solve, the equation for the phase of the electrons, the equation for the energy of the electron, and the equation for the field, the evolution of the electromagnetic field. Uh, these are written in normalized um, units. 
normalized units tourists really like them and in fact but they, they are important over here because uh, um, uh, the whole system when it's written in normalized units it's very simple uh, it has a very simple expression and uh, you can easily see that these are basically you can linearize this and uh, the uh, solution to the linearized equation is a three equation if you linearize the determinant associated with this system it's going to be a cubic uh, equation one uh, two of the roots of the cubic equation are uh, imaginary so basically this gives you an exponential growth of the radiation this is how you calculate the uh, uh, radiation uh, uh, growth length and it's important because all the key characteristics of the FEL are given by a single universal FEL parameter. So all these equations, if you write them in that normalized uh, uh, units, uh, which I showed before, the only parameter that enter here is this row parameter. And so the typical, the important numbers you want to find out, how long does the undulator needs to be, what is the power at saturation, how long uh, 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 you need to wait until you get to saturation, and the line width of the radiation are all dependent on this row parameter. So this row parameter basically defines the FEL system. Let's put numbers to make a concrete example. The number of photons at the end will be proportional to rho. Q is the number of electrons. And uh, this is the energy of the electron beam divided by the energy of the photon beam. So for our FE, uh, LCLS parameter, 10 kilovolt photons, 15 GeV, uh, uh, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 ele electrons. This rho is typically on the order of 10 to the minus 3. We number of photons is 10 to the 12. Right? Remember that here we have 10 to the 9 electrons, so number of uh, photons uh, of a synchrotron source, like without taking into account FEL interaction, will be this number times alpha, basically, right? Uh, so um, 10 to the 7 or so. So we gain five orders of magnitude with respect to the spontaneous radiation, and on top of that, this radiation is coherent. That's why we have like a large increase in the brightness. Now, how do you remember that the, the elect you want the electrons to have all the same energy and all the same velocities? And these are the condition for the FEL equation. The energy spread has to be smaller than rho. The emittance, as we discussed, if you want coherent emission, has to be smaller than lambda over 4 pi. And this is a condition on the diffraction, which at x-rays, there is not a lot of diffraction, so it's not that important. So an essential ingredient for FEL, this is what made XFEL possible, you need a very high brightness electron beam. This is a different expression, different way of writing the uh, row parameter, and you see that it depends on the beam current and the beam emittance. You want to have a very large current and a very small emittance. Up until 15 or 20 years ago, uh, beams with very large current and very small emittance to allow the FEL instability at the angstrom wavelength were not existing. So a lot of research uh, had to go into make beams with very large current and very small emittance, very bright in terms of like density in the phase space. And uh, this uh, RF for the injector, radio frequency for the injector, they all depends on the source, of course, because of Liouville's theorem. So the, the, the secret, basically, the, the uh, key element in developing XFEL was to develop a uh, very bright electron source. This was done in the, next, in the last 15 years, and this would allow the possibility for XFL, together with a lot of other progress, but this was certainly a key element. Um, one question would be, what happened to quantum mechanics? Uh, of course, uh, it's laser, but uh, and there are photons, but really, um, the parameters that define the, if we are in the quantum regime or not is if you emit a photon, does the electron loses a lot of energy or not? And this is determined by this uh, um, basically quantum uh, parameter regime, but we are all typically in the classical regime. So the electron emits many photons before its energy is really outside the FEL gain band. And so for, uh, um, in order to deal with the interaction you've seen, we have only used a classical equation. Let me talk also uh, about the uh, uh, temporal and uh, noise property of XFL. People have probably heard if you use XFL, they're very noisy and they're not fully temporally coherent. And this is why. 
So each electron, as he travels, this is the light cone of the electrons, um, the radiation propagates faster than the electron and slips uh, by uh, a wavelength each undulator period. So the electrons talk with different electrons, and the phase can be coherent only over a certain cooperation length, which is this given by the slippage in a gain length. So um, because we're starting from noise, the local intensity basically is going to be, um, uh, yeah, this is the same uh, exponential growth here that is the noise of the beginning, this is a temporal profile. Now the phase can be coherent only over a small distance. So the output of an XFL of a SASI FEL, which is starting from noise, from spontaneous emission, is going to be given by a sequence of spikes. And uh, um, the width of these spikes uh, is uh, given by basically the cooperation length. Uh, this was, of course, verified. What is important is the noise, the amplitude of noise. Of course, like um, these spikes change shot to shot continuously, but the total amount of the energy in each pulse is given by the integral of this power over uh, the spike. So if you have multiple spikes, uh, the uh, fluctuations are going to be smaller, but the pulse, of course, is going to be longer. And this is what uh, one of the first evidence uh, in the first experiments done in 98, when the SASI was demonstrated, uh, was uh, one of the first evidence that this was really SASI was really the noise in the uh, actual uh, radiation. OK, so you have, uh, this is not ideal, of course, but it's the best way to make this work. So the SASI is the simplest way to make it work. And a lot of the, most of the FEL is, are based on SASI. It's actually the only way to make this work at hard X-rays. You can actually put a seed, an input radiation seed, in order to have the phase coherent and a very temporally coherent beam. And this is done in the soft X-ray, at least in, uh, at Fermi in Italy, and a flash. And uh, in order to make an oscillator, you need to develop X-ray mirror. This is only a proposal up to now. So um, the XFEL, this theory was developed. And then uh, uh, in 1992, um, Claudio Pellegrini uh, actually proposed to use the slack LINAC to actually make an X-ray laser. 17 years later, they actually um, were able to convert to the slack Linux shown here and uh, lace. This is the same exponential growth. Now the red dots, these are the simulation in blue, and the red dots are the measurement. So this actually works, and the wavelength here was 1.5 axis. This is how it works. It starts with a radio frequency volt injector, and there is a bunch of uh, Linux and uh, compressor in order to increase the current and keep the emittance small. This is a classical scheme for most of XFL. Um, uh, table of parameters, mostly for reference here for the hard X ray FEL. Typically, you have energy between microjoule and millijoule, and light width on the order of 10 to the minus 3, and pulse duration from a few femtoseconds to 100 uh, femtoseconds. And these are the soft, typically the flash and the Fermi soft X-ray. Here, the nice thing of the soft X-ray is that you can see it, and so the radiation can be um, um, uh, can have better line width. You can go down to 10 to the minus 4 uh, line width. OK, so in the last like uh, uh, five, uh, 10 minutes here, um, five minutes, I think, uh, line, uh, just five slides, I, I want to just give you an idea of what are the frontiers of what are we working on. How do we try to improve these tools that are already working uh, in an excellent way and are already making a lot of science? So one big problem, of course, is to improve the longitudinal coherence. Uh, we don't really like this spiky structure in time and the uh, noisy structure in intensity. So we want to improve that. Also, the if energy transfer efficiency is typically limited to rho, which, uh, remember, is an order of 10 to the minus 3. So we have a beam which is very powerful, but we're only taking extracting 0.1% of the radiation. So the peak power can be actually have the potential to increase that a lot if we can find a better efficiency uh, in the energy transfer. Also, a lot of users want to have multiple color or a different time delay, so we can manipulate the X-ray spectrum or temporal structure. A lot of people want to generate much shorter pulses and of course, a lot of people want XFL. So can we use a high gradient accelerator so that we don't have all to go at slack, where they, that's the only place where we have a two mile long accelerator to have an XFL? So one slide on each of these topic. Different schemes to improve the longitudinal coherence. One possibility, you start from noise. And then before you reach saturation, you use a monochromator. 
So just a, a crystal which takes a single uh, component of the frequency and you only amplify the single component of the frequency. This is done, this is called self-seeding and uh, it's one way to reduce the line width of the FEL. Another no, possibility is. is to increase the cooperation <laughs> length. Remember the line width is given by one over the uh, uh, basically by rho, which is uh, one over the cooperation length in time. And the way, in order to make electrons talk with each other more, you can introduce delays. So these electrons then later on will be able uh, to, the red electrons, will, you shift the radiation, and so now the red and the blue will talk, they become, I guess, orange, and now all these uh, um, radiations is coherent, and now you have a narrower line width. You increase the length of the spike. How do you um, improve the energy transfer efficiency? So wh why do, does the FEL saturate? The reason for why the FEL saturates is that the particle, as they emit radiation, they lose energy. But now they lose energy, they fall out of the resonant condition. So typically, the efficiency is limited to rho. What you can do, you can taper the undulator. You can change the parameter of the undulator, like for example, the period and the k, to keep the electrons in resonance as they lose energy. So in this way, you can extract like maybe 10% of the electron beam energy, and we're working on this 10 terawatt XFL. Um, of course, only on simulation so far, but uh, there is plans to do that. Two colors. There are many schemes here. The papers are lots of papers, lots of people thinking about making two different colors for pump and probe experiments. And uh, this can be done by sending two beam of different energy uh, of uh, variable delay. Uh, disc or uh, ch uh, using undulators tuned at different frequencies, and uh, um, there are already experiments as LAC which are using uh, two color uh, uh, X rays. Uh, another important uh, um, research direction is to make pulses shorter. Uh, one way, for example, is to uh, compress a low charge beam. So you send a very, very uh, small. A short electron beam in the undulator. This is probably the best way, but uh, the problem is that uh, the charge has to be very low, and the slack Linux wasn't really built to to send in like very low charges. So this has, an, has been done, and this is the way people do 10 femtosecond pulses right now, or sub 10 femtosecond pulses. Uh, another possibility to get even shorter beam, you spoil the emittance of most of the beam except a little slice. Now, all the emittance, so by basically sending the beam in a small slit, all these electrons, the blue electrons, are going to have bad emittance, and so they're not going to emit coherently. So the FEL is not going to, instability is not going to work there, but the red electrons, which have not seen any material, they're not scattered, they are unspoiled, and they emit radiation, and the spike can be very short. Another possibility is to use a few cycle uh, laser, like a femtosecond laser, to modulate the electron energy and make the emission only over a, a fraction of this, uh, uh, basically detune the electrons except a small fraction of them. The big goal, of course, can we make, can we each, have in each one of our university, an XFL? Uh, this is uh, the concept that we like to call fifth generation light source. The fourth generation light source, by the way, is the XFL. So how can we do this? What do we need? Well, we need a few GV electron beam in our universities. This is not easy to get, but there is a lot of people, uh, a lot of different schemes like plasma acceleration, the electric acceleration, inverse FEL, the use of micro undulators, so period much smaller, so that you need, like, instead of GV energy beam, like hundreds of MEV energy beam. Uh, all this, there is a large section of research that is trying in the direction of making an XFEL smaller. If you can accelerate a beam in one meter to 10 GeV, by the way, there is a nice cover of nature on the topic of plasma acceleration this week. Um, if you can accelerate the beam in 10 GeV in a meter, then you can have your XFEL in the sub basement. So that's the big question, and a lot of people are working on it. Okay, conclusions. Um, so uh, X-ray FEL, uh, FEL, of course, are great because they give us an unprecedented view of the structure and dynamics of matter at the fundamental scales, angstrom and femtosecond. Um, the, flex the, the, the systems are flexible, so there is a lot of room to improve in terms of X-ray pulse intensity, time duration, and spectral properties. 
And these are just a couple of examples, but I guess uh, uh, your center is going to find even more experiments to do with the XFTL. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pietro. Thanks for getting us off to a great start. Perfect.